All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Jim here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 53, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yes, we got some stuff today. Not that much of pretty much everything, to be honest. Like, we got some a couple of really cool articles, but everything else seems to be kind of quiet. I'm not sure what's up with that. Maybe people are taking vacations now or something because it's, you know, spring and everything. The weather here is not particularly good. So if I suddenly disappear in the middle of the podcast, that is because we have very strong wind. And during the week, we already had one uh, power outage because the wind broke some power lines. So if the podcast just stops in the middle, this is exactly why it happened and you know why I just disappeared. So, uh, hey Donna, welcome to the stream. Hello, Manda Putra, welcome to the stream. Hey, Abhi, welcome to the stream, guys. Let's get started. The first article we got here is called Hooks for React.js, the new catch-up. And it is essentially a sort of overall introduction to the hooks, uh, starting from the explanation of what problems hooks are solving, how exactly are they doing it, what is the selling point, and the basic tutorials for hooks. So if you are working with React but still didn't get time to you know, get into the hooks, or was too lazy to search for the information all over the place because, you know, even though the official documentation is quite good, it doesn't quite explain everything about the hooks. This stuff here is essentially all in one uh, getting started guide for the React hooks. So if you wanted to get into them, just read through this article and you will know everything you need to know. If you're already working with the hooks, there is nothing new here. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. Is it snowy? No, it's not snowy here. It's just incredibly windy. And we've been getting like rains and showers and stuff like this, which is a, a bit crazy. Like it doesn't feel like spring yet, but it's quite warm on the other hand. So there you go. All right, continuing, we got higher order functions and some great applications in JavaScript. Another article for the people who are, um, I mean, not another, but you know, it's just an article for the people who just started developing in JavaScript and still are not quite sure what the higher order functions are and where would they be useful. So if you are struggling with the concept, this is a very good tutorial that will explain to you what they are and how do you use them and also show you some um, realistic application scenarios where you would use them in sort of real life apps. Some of those scenarios are going to get outdated pretty soon, like using the private variables because we are getting the private uh, properties and classes. I mean, they already shipped in the Chrome uh, Canary, I believe, maybe in the beta already even. But yeah, there you go. If you already know what the hardware functions are and how do you use them, you won't really find anything new here. Continuing, we got the article called Writing Unit Tests for a Rewrite, a Case Study. So this is, um, how do I explain it? So this article is not a very technical one. It doesn't contain, uh, you know, too much code or anything like that. It's more of a meta discussion on importance of unit tests and what kind of unit tests do you need to have when you are preparing for application rewrite, right? I've seen a lot of people attempt rewriting or refactoring their code without having proper tests. And it almost never goes well, right? So if you are planning to rewrite your app or parts of it, make sure you have tests covering the parts that you're going to change. And the most important bits, so like the article doesn't just talk about that, right? It talks about, okay, so we have this sort of different approaches, different tooling, uh, what kind of tests you can have, unit integration, whatever. And then it talks about the uh, more specific things like, you know, that edge cases are more important than your common cases because common cases, you know, it just works and works. And edge cases are, they can be extremely finicky and it can be extremely hard to actually reproduce. Uh, in some cases, you have to be very, very careful about setting the test for them up. And yeah, the other stuff is like, be always very specific about the errors, like, well, no, sorry, not about the errors, but just be very specific about the tests. For example, here is an error that, you know, should be a very specific error when you pass in a not a number and so on and so forth. So if you are planning to rewrite your app or if you are interested in unit testing in general, make sure to check this one out. It is a very good article that will give you a sort of a conceptual overview of what you should expect when preparing a unit test for a rewrite. Um, Donna, thank you very much for the donation as usual, highly appreciate it. Right, let's continue. 
Next article we got here is from the overreacted blog by Dan Abramov, and it talks about how our function components different from classes, uh, meaning the React function components and React classes as always. So this is, uh, again, Dan Abramov's blog, which means that 90% of topics are React related. And just as the title says, it compares the differences, uh, actually mostly subtle differences that you wouldn't even think about between the functional component and class components, right? So there is a very simple component here that is a profile page that has a follow button on it. And that's basically it's written in functional way and a class way. There is even a GIF comparing the code here, which looks well nearly identical, right? It's very, very close. And then Dan goes into the uh, sort of deep dive to see what exactly is the difference when you click the follow button on class and on function. And why does this happen? So it's a pretty deep dive into how they work and what is the difference. And I would highly recommend reading this to basically everyone who works with React. It might be obvious for you, like, you know, if you worked a couple of years with it and you already know all the intricacies, but there are some things that will just confuse you at first. Uh, like it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. It's a really great article and quite highly recommended reading. All right, next thing we got here is Gopher meets Plasma WebAssembly experiment. Uh, this is a pretty neat one. So the author here used the WebAssembly to uh, generate the Plasma panel, or I guess a Plasma canvas, and then render it into JavaScript using Canvas. So the if you didn't know, uh, Golang allows you to compile the Go um, code into WebAssembly just by passing it uh, GoS and Go uh, architecture as WebAssembly and GoS as JavaScript. That's basically all you need to do. And then you can use that WebAssembly module inside of your JavaScript, be it browser or Node.js, to uh, do whatever the hell you want with it, right? So he built the Golang function that generates the Plasma um, canvas, I guess. It's, it's basically an array of points, right? And then he loaded that module in the browser and used the very basic uh, canvas JS rendering to just render it pixel by pixel. And the final result looks something like this. The code is open. There is a bit more explanation in the article. So if that sounds like an interesting demo for you, do check it out. It is a pretty neat example on essentially how you can invoke Go code from uh, JavaScript, which we already did on one of the streams. So if you're curious, do check my video out as well. All right, next thing we got here is understanding a performance issue with a polymorphic JSON data. Um, this is probably one of my favorite articles uh, in this uh, podcast. It talks about um, how the same shape but different kind of values in the JSON data might have a surprising effect on J JavaScript performance, right? So the idea is that if you have, uh, if you parse the JSON object, uh, which sort of have the same shape but might have the different values or types of values actually, right? This is more precise. You might get a completely different performance in the resulting application, which is something I didn't actually know that this was a thing. So we got we got two articles talking about that this time around. And uh, this is the first one. This, this one talks specifically about JSON parsing. There's some uh, benchmarks here with different uh, engines even. Uh, there's, by the way, a really cool tool called Multitime um, that is introduced that allows you to test the same code using different JavaScript engines, including V8, SpiderMonkey, Chakra, and GSC. So if you are doing a lot of testing, make sure to check this one out. This seems to be very handy. And uh, yes, uh, so yeah, if you are writing highly or if you need to write highly performant code that works with the differently shaped articles, uh, sorry, articles, objects, <laughs> Make sure to have a look at this article because it does outline some of the interesting features of the JavaScript engines that essentially impact the performance quite a lot when you don't think about this kind of stuff at all, right? So it's, it's I didn't even think that having the JSON objects that are shaped in the same way, but have different value types, even, you know, as, in, as simple as just having different integer and number, or like, I guess the float, right? Or I, I think JavaScript represents them is doubled, right? Would impact the performance that much, but it is like this. And as it seems like the simple, simplest solution is to just use the different shapes for the objects using different value types, which is absolutely fascinating. So if you're interested in details do check it out, it's a really cool one. Right. 
Next article we got here is from uh, Mr. Can See Dots, who finally moved his blog from Medium to his own website, which actually looks slick as hell and doesn't have any of the Medium bullshit here. So the article is called React Hooks Compound Components, and it talks about uh, building compound components using the hooks and all the related things to it. So there is a really neat uh, technique that he outlined here using the nested, uh, or I guess property components, if I'm not sure how you call that properly, but I think it's a really neat uh, way of doing it. So this sort of compound toggle button that also has toggle.on, toggle.off and toggle.button that you can optionally render within the toggle component itself. Uh, it also shows you how to use the newly added hooks, or I mean, I guess they are not as, <laughs> as newly added as they were like a couple of months ago, right? But they are still quite fresh to make those, to assemble those compound components and uh, use stuff like, you know, context to make it uh, easier on you so if you look at the code here, this on and off uh, subcomponents are actually very, very simple and use the embedded context to uh, simplify things like, I don't know, tenfold maybe, because this is just very elegant pattern. So if you are using compound components that essentially allow user to, um, or developer to specify different states of the component, do check this out. There is some really nice patterns over here. All right, next article we got here is how to enable React strict mode. So React strict mode was introduced in January 2018. That is uh, more than a year ago now, right? But it seems like still not a lot of people know about it. So um, the idea behind React strict mode is quite simple, like enabling it literally just requires wrapping your app into the react.strict mode tag. And the idea behind the strict mode is that it will execute all of your code twice in development mode. So this is a very important note. When you run it in development, all of the code, all of the constructors, renders, set states, whatever, will be triggered twice, right? The idea is that as long as your code is um, predictable, right? As long as it's deterministic, you won't have any problems with running the same code twice. But as soon as you have something weird going on, some weird state of, uh, sorry, side effects, some weird global state that can just screw things over, um, your app will start behaving weirdly. And this is exactly why it was made. This is exactly what it allows you to catch. Um, yes, there is some caveat supplied, like, you know, third party code that might not work well with it and so on and so forth. But if that mode sounds interesting, definitely do check it out. So I, I personally prefer writing the um, functional components now that even now that, you know, we have hooks, it's like all the way easier. And uh, enabling strict mode, literally, um, I, I think I've tried it in like three or four apps that we have, and it's never made any difference just because we use functional components in like 90% of places. But it can be extremely useful to catching those weird bugs that you might have, especially with the class components and, you know, global state and mutable side effects, which might just screw things over a tiny bit. So if you never heard of it, do check it out. It is a very good introduction. All right, next thing we got here is using CSS selectors in JavaScript. Uh, what it is really about is about using document.querySelector or I guess query selector function that allows you to select various elements from the DOM and then all the sort of selectors that you can pass to it, which is exactly CSS selectors, well, not, not exactly CSS, right? It's also um, elements and class selectors and more precise, I don't know, do this all count as CSS selectors? That's the thing I don't know actually, I never, um, never question the terminology here. But anyway, if you already know how the document.query selector works, then you won't really find anything new here. If you are just starting with JavaScript and if you never heard about some of those, because there are some very complex ones you can actually do, then do check it out. It's a very good introdu uh, int introducer, no introduction. <laughs> right. Next article we got here is maintaining global state in Amazon Web Services Lambda functions with async hooks. So this is an interesting one. I, as a person who didn't really touch uh, Amazon Lambda that much, can't really comment, uh, you know, too much on it, but it seems to be an interesting problem. So the idea is that when you run your function, you need some way to persist global state, right? So the, to be sort of to, to, to have the application state essentially. And um, the simplest way to do that is obviously to um, write it to a file system like S3 bucket or something, right? Uh, but if you do this with a function, you will end up um, 
just adding the same state over and over and over again, which might be a problem for you, right? So the other year proposes using async hooks and setting up these hooks uh, to sort of maintain the state for you. So if you if you didn't know the async hooks is sort of this instrumental, um, or I guess, how do you put it? Uh, it's a tool that allows you to instrument your code and to uh, tap into the actions that actually happen within your application, uh, sort of, you know, before, after, on, on destroy of different async methods. Uh, now, using this async hooks allows you to actually track whatever happens in the code. And you can see here the exact events that happen, like, you know, TCP wrapping, get address information, HTTP parsing, uh, TCP connection, and so on and so forth. That's like, I think there's like a more than a hundred probably of those hooks actually happening uh, with uh, your typical app. And uh, author just proposes essentially using the global state map that would be created on the hook in it and then destroyed once the hook is destroyed or once the hook is resolved, which sounds like a neat idea. And it seems to be working quite well for this case. Now, I'm not sure about the performance of it because I remember reading somewhere that the async hooks are not yet as fast as they could be. But if I remember correctly, there was one of the proposals in the node team to make them even faster. So, you know, it's probably should be quite fine. I mean, you know, the, the problem I have is essentially is when you are building the Lambda functions, you want them to be as fast as possible, right? Because you pay per second or per millisecond of execution. So the faster your function is, the less you're gonna pay. So if you are using something that slows it down, it might be suboptimal. But nonetheless, it's a really neat approach. So if you're working with the Lambda functions, make sure to check it out. Maybe you'll pick up something useful from here. Next article we got here is JavaScript Fundamentals, Master the DOM. Uh, this is a two-part article that is sort of a very deep dive into the document object model or DOM. Um, if you are working with JavaScript and HTML and browsers for a long time, you won't really find anything new here. This is very much the introduction to it. If you are just getting started and you still don't understand the DOM completely, or you're having some problems with some of the things inside of the DOM or how to interact with, with JavaScript, how does it actually represent it in the memory? How does it, the CSS work and so on and so forth? Then this article series is basically for you. So do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is JavaScript performance pitfalls in V8. This is another article that is extremely cool in today's podcast. Uh, and uh, it also talks about the performance in uh, JavaScript and specifically in V8. And um, in this case, it talks about two very specific cases. First one being the optimization limit, the fact that uh, V8 turbofan actually has a 60 kilobytes limit in bytecode which is, uh, you know, if your function is bigger than the 60 kilobytes, it will not be optimized, right? So you have to keep that in mind. There is a, uh, well, synthetic example here that shows you what exactly happens and how do you can actually uh, debug that and figure out why was your code optimized or why it was not optimized. And uh, yeah, so this one, you know, this is sort of a reminder to keep your functions small and nice so that the compiler can actually optimize them for you. And the um, second thing is the double fields. Um, the idea that uh, you can have the different, um, so the different allocation based on the type of the field, right? If it's a double or if it's like actually a heap number. It is like this one is just something I did. So I, I knew the, the point about the, um, uh, the so God damn it, I'm, <laughs> I'm being terrible today. So I knew the point about the uh, function optimization, right? So this is something that I think more or less widely known um, and is mentioned a lot of times, but the double fields and uh, the difference in allocation of uh, different um, numeric values being on double type or uh, integer type in heap is something I did not know before. So it is very interesting to see that depending on how you define your object shape and how you define your um, mutable number, it will be completely differently allocated within the heap and the engine will manage it in a totally different way as well, meaning that you know you actually want to define those things initially in a constructor as uh, in, like as the values that you're gonna use there. 
so that the engine can actually optimize that. There are some downsides here as well, so make sure to read that. But it is something that I did not know about, which is kind of very interesting. Uh, so yeah, if you care about performance optimizations in JavaScript and uh, you care about how the V8 works, make sure to read this article. It is damn good. All right, next thing we got here is use TypeScript, a complete guide to React hooks and TypeScript. This is essentially, yes, just as the title says, a complete guide on how to write uh, TypeScript. God damn it. How to write React hooks using TypeScript and how to type them properly because it seems that it is not as trivial as you would expect, which kind of makes sense because, you know, hooks are pretty complex uh, in terms of reasoning and there's a lot of assumptions going on from the React side, from the user side and so on and so forth. So it seems like it might be a bit tricky to type them in TypeScript. Again, I am not a TypeScript person, so cannot really say much more about that. But if you are using TypeScript, this guide seems to be pretty complete. So if you were looking into the hooks or you had problems with them, make sure to check this one out. Next article we got here is hand track JS, hand tracking interaction in the browser using TensorFlow.js in three lines of code. This is an introduction of hand track JS library that allows you to, yes, exactly as it says, set up a hand tracking in three lines of code, uses TensorFlow.js and pre-trained model as you expect. Has a decent performance, like 22 FPS on a new MacBook with 2.2 gigahertz uh, CPU and 13 FPS on an older MacBook with an older CPU, which I mean, I guess, you know, for the browser, that is actually quite impressive, to be honest. The library is open source and available on GitHub if you want. And the article itself describes uh, how to use it and showcases some of the things you can actually do with it, which is kind of cool. So if you ever wanted to do something like uh, make an app that allows you to draw things with hands or make a pong where you use your hands to um, control the paddle, then you can do that. And you can do it in JavaScript right in your browser and seems to be working quite well actually. So there you go. Right, next thing we got here is uh, building rich command line interfaces with Ink and React. This is an introduction to an Ink library that does exactly what the title says. It allows you to build the command line apps using React uh, as, as uh, your sort of library for UI interactions, right? So it provides you a render method and a set of components that allow you to build very rich command line applications. If you ever use Jest, I believe they actually use it in their um, output. So. It, it looks quite amazing, to be honest. And they just released the version two, which I think is even, you know, like better, faster, and so on and so forth. So if you are building uh, complicated command line tools, then do check it out. This seems to be quite awesome. All right. Next thing we got here is tutorial, how to share code between iOS, Android, web, and React Native. React Native web and monorepo. That is a lot of things. Um, to share the code between, but essentially it's a tutorial that shows you how you can set up uh, React Native for three different platforms and share the common code between them using a monorepo approach and Yarn workspaces. So if you are not using Yarn, then well, there's nothing you can really do here because Yarn workspaces is sort of the, at the core of all of this. But if that sounds like, you know, the project that is similar to what you're working on or uh, to what you wanted to work on, then do check it out. There is some good tips over here. Next article we got here is how to render 3D in 2D Canvas. And this is basically um, trigonometry in JavaScript. Uh, do you like trigonometry? Because there is a lot of it over here. It essentially shows you as how to render a pretty basic sphere or I guess a bunch of different 3D objects in 2D in Canvas. Which again, you know, it's a pretty basic trigonometry here. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it basic because this stuff always breaks my mind every time I try to think about it. But yes, it is possible. Yes, you can do it. And yes, it is kind of awesome. So if you are interested, you can, yeah, you can also render this stuff like emojis of animals rotating in a sphere. <laughs> I don't know why, but yes, you can do that. It's a great article. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. All right, next thing we got here is scheduling in React. There's an article that talks about the upcoming asynchronous uh, scheduler and uh, what was the second thing? Wait a second, I forgot. It was uh, sets, um, 
I think it was, yeah, uh, there was the async scheduler and there was something else there, was it? Or am I forgetting things already? Right, basically it talks about the upcoming React asynchronous scheduler that was demoed back in 2018, I think, by Dan on one of the conferences. And that sort of makes the rendering asynchronous and allows you uninterrupted user inputs especially, you know, this is visible with the current version when you get like the very heavy and intensive rendering going on, the React starts, uh, so the input starts stuttering, right? Because the React will re-render every time and it will block the main thread. What the async renderer does is actually throttles the rendering and makes it asynchronous as the title suggests, so that user can interact with the input as he pleases and the rendering will just be done in the free time essentially which is very awesome. And this is sort of the more in-depth explanation of what the hell's going on and how is it going to change the way that React works. And uh, yeah, you can even use it today with a react.unstable concurrent mode if you want to. Um, so if you are interested, do check it out. It's a very neat addition to React, which should be coming to production and to everyone basically in uh, second quarter of 2019, meaning uh, we should get it in the next couple of months, I guess. So there you go. All right. Uh, and the last article I think we have today in this section is JavaScript symbols, but why? An explanation of why exactly did we need JavaScript symbols and how are they different from just using uh, strings or other types of values for properties in objects, right? So if you are curious as to why do we need symbols and where you can actually use them, do check this article out. It will guide you through it. All right, that is actually it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to a smaller bit um, sized awesomeness and different things. The first thing I want to highlight today is this new proposal from the V8 team uh, that is called fast string concatenation in JavaScript. And those crazy people in V8 development team want to make uh, string concatenation in JavaScript even faster than it is now. I mean, I wouldn't call it slow, like it's it's already quite fast, right? I never I never had any problems with it, to be honest. I did some pretty complex things on uh, like streamed on data sets up to one terabyte using Node.js as a, you know, as a stream processing. So it's like usually was pretty large uh, CSV files or something like this. And you read it string by string, uh, yeah, line by line is what I want to say. And then you do some operations and write it into the database. And that worked quite fast. I like, I'm not sure how fast they can make it. But yeah, knowing that this is a V8 team, it looks like the string concatenation is about to get even faster. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is a really neat thing called JavaScript loose comparison step by step. This is a sort of a demo page that explains you uh, step by step what exactly happens when you loosely compare two different values. And there's like, you can enter your values or you can select any of the examples available. Like for example, comparing object with full property to just 42. And there's a very, very detailed explanation of what happens step by step, which is really, really awesome. So, uh, and yeah, by the way, you notice this below by iterations, which is different sort of iterations that actually do that, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So if uh, you are still not completely sure how the loose comparison in JavaScript works, make sure to look at this explainer because this is probably the best one I have seen so far. Right, next thing we got here is a demo for how use reducer and use context for dispatch can improve performance compared to just use state and passing down the callbacks. So this is the continuation of that article that we talked about, I believe two or three podcasts before, so there's this repo hooks performance issues that um, shows how sort of, or I guess tried to show how the hooks in React might be slower than the components. And then replied with a bit better suggestion. And then now he introduces the alternative that uh, uses use reducer and use context to speed it up even more. So if you are curious about how you can optimize your React code using hooks, then this is definitely a recommended um, sample, basically. There is some pretty cool things in here. So make sure to check it out if you're working with React and hooks. 
Next thing we got here is W3C approves WebAuth N as the web standard for password free logins. So we are finally getting this as a W3C standard, which means it's going to come to all the browsers in the nearest future and maybe in, I don't know, five years, three years, four years. I don't want to be overly optimistic here. Uh, we're going to get passwordless authentication on the web, which actually would be quite awesome. Like I'm all in for that. I bloody hate passwords. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is the announcement that the Node.js modules team just reached the consensus on what we plan to upstream, aka the first iteration of the new ES modules implementation. So I am guessing we're going to see the ES modules in Node.js in the next half a year in already, you know, the proper stable version. So there you go. This is quite exciting. Next thing we got here is the new diagram of modern React lifecycle methods uh, from Dan Abramov. This is only working for classes and people are already asking him to do the same for the hooks, <laughs> which actually would be extremely useful. And if he does it, I will share it on the podcast. Right, next thing we got here is a request for feedback for the new TC39 website. So if you are interested in TC39 related things, and if you have time, do check out their website and submit the feedback to the um, Yulia. So there you go. That is actually it for short things. Now we're coming to the releases section. The first major release of the week is Storybook version 5.0. That looks absolutely stunning. It got a bunch of improvements, new design support for themes and 200 other different minor improvements. So yeah, if you're using Storybook, this should be quite exciting for you. If you are not and writing user components, um, then make sure to check it out. It's a very good tool. Next thing we got here is Preact X Alpha. I have linked to the uh, initial release here, but there's already a newer version, which I believe is Alpha 1 now. Um, yeah, it's smaller, faster, better with support for fragments, component did catch, hooks, create context, uh, custom CSS properties. DevTool adapters and a ton of other different features. Preact is keeping being awesome, so do check it out. Next release we got here is Marble JS 2.0, reactive, better, functional, stronger. So if you never heard of it, Marble is a functional reactive HTTP framework built on top of Node, TypeScript, and RxJS. Essentially, it's sort of like ExpressJS, but built on top of RxJS and allows you to handle requests using the RxJS piping, which is actually surprisingly good. So if that sounds awesome, do check it out. If you are, if you never tried RxJS, don't even think about it. That is too complicated. You need to know RxJS to use this thing basically. All right. Next thing we got here is Unfetch version 4.1, which is a fetch polyfill. It is now just 478 bytes and fits into one tiny image. That's basically all you have to know about it. Next release we got here is node version 11.11 .11 with uh, some minor improvements and uh, additional integration for the worker with the native add-ons. And that's basically it. So it's just, you know, minor stuff. Right. And I think the final thing we got here today is ESLint plugin React hooks, which is something you should be using if you are using hooks here because it added exhaustive depths feature which literally tells you when you are doing hooks wrong, which is just freaking fantastic. Make sure to check out the tweet here that shows it off. And it also, um, sorry, it also adds the auto fix rule for ESLint that will basically fix your stuff for you, which is absolutely fantastic. So there you go. All right, now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. The first uh, thing we got here today, we already talked about Deno more than once, the new project from the Randall, who is original creator of Node.js. So Deno is a browser-like command line runtime, which is the new slogan. And Deno now has a website that actually shows you how to install it and how to run a basic server on it, which is kind of neat. So it seems like Deno is progressing quite nicely. and. Uh, we're probably going to see some more or less stable builds in the nearest future. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is Maps Journey Replay, a JavaScript library that loads a journey JSON object, coordinates plus timestamps, and creates a replay on a map. That's basically all it does. And uh, yeah, it seems to be quite nice. I, like if you ever wanted to do that, do check it out. 
Next thing we got here is an avatar. Get unified user avatar by using the username or email or a domain name. Seems to be working quite nicely. Seems to be asking a bunch of different services and just finding the most appropriate, like the, you know, the first fitting avatar, basically. You can do that for either email, username, or a domain name, as I said. Seems to have a lot of different methods, which is quite nice. So if you are in need of avatars, do check it out. Now, next thing we got here is French Kiss JS, blazing fast, lightweight uh, internationalization module for JavaScript. Yet another one seems to be yeah, way faster than just about anything else uh, out there. But yeah, I haven't had time to check it out. It seems to be just basically string based, uh, doesn't have any specific tooling. So you would have to integrate it with React or any other framework yourself. But uh, if you wanted something, um, you know, fast, then do check it out. Yes, the name is quite amusing. I completely agree on that. <laughs> All right, um, next thing we got here is Victorious Linear Algebra in TypeScript. It's a library for working with linear algebra in TypeScript. That's basically all I have to know. Seems to be quite full featured. There's like a ton of methods here. So do check it out if you are working in this area. And next thing we got here is ESLint Config React Native Community. So the um, if you use React Native, you know that it came with its own ESLint config, but the config itself was always baked in into the app, so you had no way to use it separately or to configure it or to tweak it. It was a bit annoying. Now you can. They finally published it as a separate standalone package, so you can actually either use it in your own projects or extend it or change it or tweak it or fork it or do whatever the hell you want with it, which is kind of nice. Next thing we got here is Femto.js, really small JavaScript library for DOM manipulation, only for ES6. Um, now here's the thing, it's essentially a tiny wrapper around documents, uh, query selector, and a bunch of other things that sort of aims to mimic jQuery. And uh, yeah, like if you go to the um, GitHub and look at the source, it is very, very, very tiny and very, very simple. So I am not even sure you want to use something like that instead of just using the methods here. But yeah, it does simplify things quite a bit. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is Code Server from Coder.com. So Coder.com is this startup that appeared um, quite some time ago, actually. Problem was that when you sign up, they want your uh, phone number. Good thing that you can use any fake phone number to do that. And the proposition they um, have is essentially, hey, you can actually have, um, why does it not load? Come on. You can have a full VS Code environment running right in your browser and uh, it will sort of work on the server. So you can like code on a server and then deploy it immediately and then run whatever the hell you want while working completely in the browser. Like it's literally the full VS code over here, which is very, very awesome with the terminal and everything and plugins, all of the plugins work, which is great. Like this is fantastic work, right? The problem is it was like, again, you know, first of all, they needed a phone number to register, which was annoying. I mean, they still need it, but um, now they've open sourced the thing. So you can actually run it locally in Docker which is literally just, you know, run it with a very basic one Docker command. And then you can work on your server in a specific folder and run whatever the hell you want right there, which looks pretty damn fantastic. I'm considering setting up just a separate server to just use that. I am like, I'm not sure how good that will work because one complaint I had about the coder.com is that it was a bit slow sometimes on uh, recognizing the key enters. So like, you know, you type something and it feels like there's a delay between your press of the key and when something actually happens on the server. So I'm not sure how this behaves. But nonetheless, this looks really awesome. So if you are curious, and it's completely open source, and you can roll your own, basically. Yeah, if you're curious how it was made, or you just want to try it, do check it out. It is quite good. All right, next thing we got here is Chero, very fast and lightweight standard compilant, uh, comp standard compliant, self-hosted JavaScript parsers with high focus on both performance and stability. So it's a JavaScript parser that aims to be uh, to conform to ECMAScript standards above everything, support stage three proposals with option and yeah, basically be very fast, contained and so on and so forth. 
seems to be quite good actually. So um, I haven't tried it, but you know, I've used parser more than once in a variety of projects to do like codes, modifications and different stuff. I typically used either a Spremo or Babylon. I tried Akern, which works also as well, uh, quite fine. And uh, yeah, this one seems quite nice as well. So let's, let's see, let's see how it goes. But if you're looking for yet another JavaScript parser, do check it out. Next thing we got here is AutoCannon, fast HTTP 1.1 benchmarking tool written in Node.js. So yes, this allows you to uh, essentially, um, you know, AutoCannon your server with um, concurrent requests and measure the performance and benchmark and see how exactly it will work out. So it's quite a straightforward tool. There is a variety of tools like this. This one is just written in Node.js, so you can npm install it or use it programmatically from your tests or something. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. I probably should start it because this is a kind of tool that I use quite frequently, but I typically use that um, Java one. I forgot how it's called. I, I think it's in a, the one in Apache Foundation. Okay, next thing we got here is Eero.js, color wheel widget for JavaScript with zero dependencies and lowly, uh, lo lowly, lovely SVG based UI. It looks like this is a very neat picker. And yes, it's super tiny SVG and everything. And uh, if you're looking for color picker, then this is probably a good choice. Right, that is it for the libraries and demos. Now I have some silly and interesting stuff for you. The first one being the article from Dan uh, called Coping with Feedback. It talks about how he actually copes with feedback to React hooks, React website translations and other things, which I imagine he gets like a million of different things told to him. And there's like some general, uh, you know, keeping yourself saying things like not drinking more than two cups of coffee not arguing with strangers after 9 p.m. I would even say not arguing with strangers is generally a very good advice. <laughs> not skipping meals or eating after 8 p.m. Not publishing articles right before going to bed and not lying there trying to fall asleep. If you have to cope with feedback from random people on the internet, make sure to read that. There are some really good points. And, you know, in general, just, just take your life easy. Come on. Uh, some good stuff here, so make sure to read that. Next thing we got here is absolutely fascinating article that talks about researchers that uncovered ring of GitHub accounts promoting 300 plus backdoor apps. Now here's the fascinating thing. It will be like, you know, there's nothing new about people making millions of accounts to promote their own stuff like botting has been a thing for ages. Now here's the interesting thing that people here promote so-called sneaker bots. Now this is the thing I didn't know exist. Apparently, there is a whole market of uh, people who buy the latest, fanciest sneakers from different manufacturers, especially limited editions. And apparently, the demand is so high that you can buy those sneakers with a bot, right, for like 200 bucks or something, and then flip them immediately for five to a thousand bucks just because you managed to buy them, which is just sounds insane to me, but apparently people are ready to buy those. And for that very purpose, there are sneaker bots on GitHub that essentially do the buying for you, right? Be it on GitHub or on a Nike shop or whatever. And um, apparently this network of bots fork those repos, introduce the backdoors in them, and then promote them as the legitimate versions of them, which is like, Oof, that's got to be tough on some of those people. <laughs> but yeah, this, this article in the discussion is just fascinating. So I highly recommend you just to read that and um, look like follow the links and check out the related articles and uh, check out the uh, discussion on the Reddit as well if you're interested because this area is just fascinating. All right, next thing we got here is Facebook is allowing anyone to look you up uh, using your two-factor authentication phone number. Now, yes, uh, if, you, if you have a Facebook, uh, like you know that Facebook is not a very good company uh, in terms of privacy. And before that, they allowed you to set up two-factor authentication uh, only with a phone number. So they did not have the Oath app, like OTP option at all. Now they do. And uh, right, before that, they said your phone number will only be used for the factor authentication. Well, it turns out that's not true and anyone can search you using that phone number, which is 
absolute bullshit. And if you are living in a European Union, I would recommend you removing your phone number from there using the app for 2FA and then sending them a formal GDPR request to remove your phone number because this is kind of garbage. And um, yes, it is. Bleh. Okay. Uh, next thing we got here is JavaScript considered harmful. Uh, let me try that again. JavaScript considered harmful for real, according to Japanese police. Are you happy now? Uh, so here's the thing. Japanese police is charging people for posting link to a site that run for window alert. Lol, you can get rid of this message even if you keep closing the model, which is literally just a endless for cycle that keeps opening alerts. Uh, and police charge people for posting links because it's unlawful program, which is... <laughs> Sometimes the Japanese police does the strangest things ever. This is just ridiculous, but it is very amusing. All right, and the last thing we got here is a paper from the University of Bonn, uh, where the researchers asked 43 freelance developers to code the user registration for a web app and assessed how they implemented the password storage. 26 of the developers, that is more than half, initially choose to leave the passwords as a plain text, which is mind blowing. If you ever build a web app with authentication, never ever store a password in a plain text, please just, oh my God. And um, I think one of the most amusing reactions to this was from the Troy Hunt, who, uh, who is a, you know, the uh, security researcher and uh, consultant, who said that this job has an amazing uh, job security. <laughs> So there you go. This is basically it from my side. As usual, you can find all the links on the GitHub or bxjs.dev website. Um, if you guys have any questions you have, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If you have any links I might have missed, throw them into the chat as well. If not, or if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever else, listening it on iTunes or um, CastBox, you can join our Discord server to discuss any of these things or ask for help with your JavaScript questions. We are more than happy to help there. And uh, yes, this is basically all we got for today. All right, doesn't seem like there's any questions or suggestions from the chat. So I guess that will be it for me for today. Thank you guys very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend and rest of the week. And I see you next week, Wednesday for the development stream and Saturday for another BXJS Weekly. Bye.